In 1918, an Amarillo teacher enlisted in the U.S. Navy as a chief yeoman. It was the highest possible rank for a woman in that era. It was a path that would eventually lead Agnes Meyer Driscoll to the National Security Agency's Codebreaker Hall of Fame. We call it the Cryptologic Hall of Honor, uh, and she is, uh, she is in it. Uh, when we uh, bring in new hires from um, outside, we always give them a tour of our museum and we talk about people who are in the Hall of Honor and uh, nine times out of 10, we men mentioned Mrs. Driscoll as uh, a prime uh, example, a person who should be a role model uh, for her innovative thinking. She um, seems to me to be uh, a typical daughter of uh, middle America at the time, uh, small town upbringing, traditional American values, but she got one advantage that most women of her time did not have, and that was a, a, a first-class education with uh, uh, both a math and a language uh, background, both of which would stand her in good stead as a cryptanalyst, but uh, at the time uh, she was uh, destined for one of the few occupations women uh, were prominent in in those days, and that was teaching. The youngest of three siblings, Agnes Meyer studied mathematics, physics, and foreign languages. Upon graduating from Ohio State University, she was proficient in French, German, Latin, and Japanese. From 1912 to 1915, Meyer directed music at Lowry Phillips School in Amarillo. It was primarily a military academy. She then led the Amarillo High School math department until her enlistment in 1918. We had a member of our staff who contacted the, the schools that she studied at and the schools she taught at, and they had really nothing about her except the fact of her having been there. There was a, a great uh, push to expand uh, our Army and Navy, which were small by international standards. Uh, and this included, for the first time, taking in women in uniformed service. There had been women who served before, there had been women civilians who worked with the military, but this was the first time that women were enlisted for specific uniformed jobs. And Agnes answered her country's call uh, along with the others, and not only uh, did, did she uh, help change the world, the world changed her too. Um, she became more uh, internationally oriented and uh, she found a new profession and in fact you might even say she founded a new profession in, in cryptology it was still then in its uh, infancy in america she was on the cutting edge of modern american development of cryptology uh, prior to that time when the government needed cryptanalysts it uh, went to talented amateurs university professors or sometimes military officers who were known to do this as a hobby. Uh, but for the first time in World War I, the United States found itself in need of code breakers. She entered the profession, uh, as many do, in helping to develop or test our own codes and moved from that into uh, looking into others' codes. One of the theories at the time was the best way to uh, understand whether one's own codes were up to international standards was to look at what everybody else was doing and see if they could be solved. And out of that, uh, perhaps uh, slower than it should have, it dawned on people, not only is this a good way to protect our own security uh, through testing our codes, but uh, a good way to find out what's going on around the world in areas that we need to know about. I think her most important role in the early days was as a pioneer in machine cryptology. Around the time of World War I, uh, at a number of places around the world, including the United States, but certainly in Europe, it was discovered that if you took an electric typewriter and put a rotating disk on it, uh, all you needed was one uh, typist to put a message into uh, a, a cipher and uh, one typist to take it out of the cipher back into plain text. So there was a good deal of experimentation in developing machines for encryption. There was a big business in it in the commercial sector and uh, governments, including the uh, US government, also got into this. Now, 
Uh, in fact, for uh, a couple of years after her World War I service, Agnes worked for a commercial code company. Uh, a man named Heburn had uh, been a pioneer in American uh, uh, crypto machines. Uh, unfortunately, uh, his uh, machines were not quite good enough. His company went belly up and uh, her job went with it. She went back to the Navy as a civilian, but she was one of the few people well educated in crypto machines uh, by experience in the United States. There were no manuals, there were no books, there uh, uh, were hardly any statements of theory. Uh, what counted was practical experience and Agnes Meyer, as she then was, had that kind of experience and it was valuable to the uh, U.S. Navy. In the 1930s, uh, they uh, studied Japanese maneuvers, that is, war games that uh, the Japanese Navy carried out. They carried out uh, maneuvers every year, and every third year they called, uh, they had what they called grand maneuvers that involved virtually their entire fleet. Now, as it happened, uh, the Japanese Navy played into Agnes Meyer's hands uh, in that they knew about crypto machines, but they still were kind of old fashioned. I, I might even say retro. And they used the kinds of traditional codes involving code books that uh, had uh, been used for centuries by uh, those who wanted to protect their messages. This is um, just the kind of thing a, a, a crypto analyst with a traditional upbringing or a traditional knowledge in the field uh, could handle very, very well. And they um, studied these maneuvers and learned things that we needed to know, including a couple of startling facts about the Japanese fleet. Now they would study the war games and in the war games, the Japanese would use uh, training codes. That is not the ones they would use every day. They were specially developed for the uh, uh, exercises themselves. Uh, they were not necessarily um, used during regular operations. They might give a hint, though, as to what uh, the structure was of the ones they used in uh, everyday life. But Agnes Meyer, now I guess Agnes Meyer Driscoll, uh, solved many of these. There was a report by the officer in charge. Now, in those days, uh, the Navy had a hard and fast and flexible rule that all their uh, code breakers uh, had to be uniformed officers, which meant, of course, all male. Uh, but Agnes was an important uh, exception. Yeah, and in fact, she taught the others how to do it. Uh, but a uh, report signed by the chief uniformed crypto analyst about one of the Japanese Navy war games remarked uh, that in this particular instance, the first break into this Japanese code was made by Mrs. Driscoll, as usual. Now, from studying these war games and particularly from uh, the, the uh, encrypted messages that were solved, uh, two important thing ha things happened. The first thing, the American Navy built up uh, a list of virtually every ship in the uh, Japanese Navy. This is called order of battle. So we would know what ships uh, to expect should the Japanese ever uh, come to war with us. Second, the training codes that were broken revealed the capabilities of the new Japanese battleships, and that they were uh, faster and more powerful uh, than anything the United States even had on the drawing board. They could outrace and outshoot us. So with this information uh, from broken codes, the U.S. Navy then redesigned its new class of battleships to exceed uh, the Japanese specifications. If this had not been learned in the 1930s, we would have started World War II with an even greater disadvantage than we did have. The Battle of Midway uh, had a great uh, code-breaking background, but um, uh, the work done by Mrs. Driscoll in the 1930s was important because it uh, helped the U.S. Navy to understand the uh, structure and order uh, chain of command of the Japanese Navy and also enabled us to uh, 
start building ships that were more powerful than our adversary had. So it was an indirect effect on the Battle of Midway. The uh, direct effect was uh, from a male codebreaker uh, named Joseph Roachford and a, a first class team that he had collected at Pearl Harbor. Mrs. Driscoll had only minimal to do with that, but um, uh, the work that she had done earlier certainly was the underpinning for the work that was done to solve the World War II codes the Japanese were using. She sort of um, went into decline in the uh, 1940s, almost about the time World War II was starting. She was in an automobile accident that injured her very seriously. And information is conflicting, but it's pretty apparent to me that she was never the same quality uh, person beforehand. She had um, some very good successes, but I would describe them as tactical successes rather than the kinds of strategic successes she had had in the 1930s. Uh, also, under the Navy structure, which discriminated against non-uniformed people and women, she never got the promotions that she deserved, whereas several of the Army civilian codebreakers uh, were, were uh, at the top of the civil service lists in, in terms of promotion. So, partly because of the decline in her ability, she no longer worked on problems and she did not get the uh, recognition or the remuneration that she really ought to have gotten at that stage of her life. That's why I would agree with the term neglected giant.